We're talking today about lessons to learn before the end of the world. Last week, Pastor Kurt, he talked about Daniel 1 to 6, and I'm going to talk about Daniel 7 to 12. And Daniel 7 to 12 is like Lord of the Rings meets Stranger Things with Mad Max in the middle. It's like all of these gnarly, remarkable visions of the apocalypse. The apocalypse, what does the apocalypse mean? It's a Greek word which simply means the revealing. It's a revealing. John, the divine, he had an apocalypse and it's called the book of Revelation, a revealing of the end. And it's really married to Daniel as well. They're very, very similar. You're gonna hear terms like the abomination that causes desolation. Wow, I just thought that was a teenager's bedroom, but no, it's a real thing, everybody. We'll talk about that in a second. And, and as you approach this, it can be scary. It's like marriage. <laughs> How many of you guys in here, before you got married, fully understood the opposite sex? Do not put up your hand, foolish man, okay? Because you didn't. I, I, I'll be 26 years married next month, everybody. All, all, yeah, all glory to Isabel, all glory to Isabel. But listen to this, I mean, I'm 26 years married and I'm still nowhere near PhD in woman. I am nowhere near it. But you know what? I, I wouldn't even say I've graduated. However, I know more than I used to. And when it comes to the book of Daniel, especially the last six chapters, we shouldn't be intimidated. And that's why we're teaching it today. One, because it's part of God's word. Two, and this is very important as well, is that you're going to read the book and you need to kind of understand what's happening. And three, the end of the world is important and God talks about it. Okay? So is everyone with me on that one? So let's look at this here in your outline, lessons to learn before the end of the world and moving from Daniel 1 to 6 to 7 to 12. Look at this. From the simple to the complex from the third person to the first person, because a lot of it just talks about Daniel, and then he talks about I, Daniel, he really starts talking about himself, from Aramaic to Hebrew, from prose to prophetic, and then from present life to future insights, not just stuff that was happening in his life, it's about stuff that will happen in the future. And I like this, from some of the best known biblical texts to the least known. We all know about Daniel in the lion's Yes, but what do we know about the ram and the goat in chapter 8? See, it's very different. And we're going to try and educate you just a little bit on this. But here's the big question we're going to try and answer. So if Daniel were in front of us today, what lessons would he teach us in the 21st century? What would he say to us from a book that was written around 550 BC? Well, open up your outline and write this in. Major lessons in, number one, power, major lessons in power, the humble are exalted. I'm going to read some Bible to you today. Is that okay, everybody? We're going to read some Bible. So if you've got a Bible, open it up to Daniel 7. If you don't, don't worry. It's going to appear on the screen. And we believe this to be God's written word. So last week, Pastor Kurt brought us up to the point where Daniel escaped the lion's den. And then he starts having these remarkable visions. And here we go. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. Now, we've all had dreams, but let me tell you, you've never had a dream like this. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I, Daniel, looked, and there before me were four winds. Everyone go, Ooh. There you go, four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Stop there for a, man, a moment. In biblical times, everyone understood the sea belonged to God. Man had no control over the sea. It was deep, it was dark, it was mysterious. And this is played out in the book of Jonah. Remember when they went on the ocean, the storm came up and they said, hey, who's made God mad? Because <laughs> we're going to throw you overboard. That's what we're going to do. They understood that the sea belonged to God. So when Daniel started talking about beasts coming out of the sea, they weren't like, ah, they were actually going, we understand this. This must be God doing this. God is in charge because he's in charge of the sea. And when we talk about beasts here, okay, everyone, are you excited about this today? It's, it's really good, isn't it? Okay, when we talk about beasts here, eh, what one person, one commentator said this, it was like God was the political cartoonist of the day. 
He was speaking in these pictures to try and help people understand that great kingdoms were going to come. Remember this as well, that Daniel is with a beleaguered group of people. They've been exiled to Babylon. They've lost all of their religious rights and customs, but they're still trusting God. And he's bringing this to them as a message of hope. Okay, so the first, verse four, the first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. What is this kingdom, everyone? What is the lion? This is the great Babylon, all right? Given the mind of a human, Nebuchadnezzar. Then, verse five, and there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth. That means it was in a feeding frenzy. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. What is the kingdom here? It's the Medo-Persians. For all the young people in the room, this is the history channel before it happened. It's pretty incredible, isn't it? He's talking about these kingdoms that would come. Now, one of them was in existence. The Persians were about to come. So it was the Babylonians, and it went into the Persians. You ready for beast number three, everyone? Okay, beast number three. After that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings, like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. What is the beast here at this point? It is the kingdom of Greece, everybody. And who was in charge of Greece? It was Alexander the... Alexander the Great, and he ruled from, he was 20 years old until he was 32 years old, and in that time, he was like a leopard, and he just stormed across the world, overcame the Persian Empire, and in 12 years, he was the number one guy before his sad demise. Number seven, you ready for beast number four? We're being properly beastly today. You thought you only lived with a beast, but there's some here in the Bible, Okay. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It's like Conor McGregor here, everybody. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. Da, 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 da. Verse 8. <laughs> While I was thinking about the horns, uh, there before me was another horn, a little horn, a little one, which came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of the human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. This little horn comes through. Now, if you were to go and read Daniel chapter 8, where Daniel 7, four beasts, out of the last beast with the ten horns comes one horn. But you will see as well in Daniel chapter 8, there are two animals. There's a ram and there's a goat. And Daniel prophesies. He said the ram will be the Persians. And the goat will be Alexander the Great, will be the Greeks. But out of the horn on the goat's head will come an even greater horn. And that horn, history proves, was a guy called Antiochus Epiphanes. Everyone say Antiochus Epiphanes. Do you feel your front lobe beginning to swell here? Now, if you were a Jew even living today, you would know immediately who Antiochus Epiphanes was. And if I was in the local synagogue and I said Antiochus Epiphanes, everyone would boo. Why? History lesson, 167 BC. According to the prophecy of Daniel, this little horn that would come up in Daniel chapter 8 out of the head of the goat, Alexander the Great. Are you all with me? Antiochus Epiphanes. He went to the temple and he said, I am going to wipe out the Jewish religion. He was like the Hitler of his day. I'm going to wipe out the Jewish religion. We're going to stop the daily sacrifices in the second temple. We're going to put it all away. And we're going to stop everyone from practicing the religion. And we're going to put in a program of paganization. And what he did, he stopped the daily sacrifices and on the altar, he put in a statue of Zeus. And for the Jews, this was an anathema. And he said this as well. He said, we're going to check your houses every single month. And if we find the Torah, the scriptures in your house, or if you've had a baby and you have the boy circumcised, we'll kill you. 
We're going to put an end to your religion. And the Jews at that time said, no, you will not. And they rose up with the Maccabeans. There was a great revolt and they defeated Antiochus Epiphanes and they uh, reinstituted their whole religion. And that's why uh, every year around Christmas that the Jews celebrate Hanukkah. Did you know that? Yeah, you know, you see it around the mall sometimes. And uh, yeah, that's where it all comes from. Are you glad you came to church today for a history lesson? Why do I tell you all of this? Why do I tell you all of this? Because it's really important that you understand that the biblical prophecies were fulfilled. They were fulfilled. This is history before it actually happens. So everyone stay with me. You all with me? A big lesson in power. God exalts the humble. But what does he do? He delegates authority and he says to us today, and this is Daniel. If Daniel were here today, he would be saying this to you. It's really important that you understand that before things get better, it's going to get worse. But kingdoms will come and kingdoms will go. Look at how he does it here. Everyone stay with me, okay? While I was thinking about, sorry, down to verse 9. Look at the change here. It said, as I looked, thrones were set in place. Are you ready to give God some praise? And the ancient of days took his seat. Who is the ancient of days, everybody? He is Yahweh, God, Jehovah, our Lord, the sovereign God of all of the ages. That's our God. What Daniel is saying here is, everybody, there's four kingdoms. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go, kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, but God rules and reigns forever. He rules and he reigns. Are you ready? It's not a political statement. Republicans come, Republicans go, Democrats come, Democrats go. Don't cheer at anything that I'm saying. It's not political, everybody. It's just going, God's in charge. Amen? God, he doesn't have a passport, everybody. You know that God doesn't have a passport? He's not a part of a political grouping at all. And it's really, really interesting that in the book of Joshua, when they're, the children of Israel are ready to cross and, and go into, uh, ready to actually go and fight for Jericho, the angel of the Lord comes and fights, or sorry, comes and meets with Joshua. And Joshua looks at him, he goes, are you for us? Or are you for your enemies? And the angel of the Lord, it was like what's called a Christophany. It's an appearance of Christ before he ever comes in flesh. He looks at him and he goes, I'm not for you and I'm not for them. I'm for me. (laughs) Boom. How cool is that, everybody? Yes? How cool is that? Don't try to get God on your side. Get on God's side. Amen, everybody? Just get on God's side. I can preach all day, but I can't because you've got to have lunch. Okay? Look at it here. This is also, it says that the ancient of days, what a great name for God. That doesn't mean he's old. He don't look like Santa. Just means that God is before time. He's the ancient of days. God doesn't have a start and he doesn't have an ending. But look at, you ready for this? But he is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. Actually, God is so cool that he finishes before he starts. Try and work that one out. That's how cool our God is. And it says that the ancient of days, he comes and what? He takes his seat. He takes his seat. So what an image of God compared to the four beasts. Because what are the four beasts doing? They're all running around crazy like Californians. (laughs) You with me? They're all like, "Ah, living this gnarly, crazy life. They're all power mad on power quests. And God says, whoa. I'm sitting down. I'm sitting down and I'm chilled and I'm relaxed. Do you want to get an image of God? Here it is, everyone. Thrones were set in place and the engines of days took a seat. His clothing was as white as snow. We serve a pure God. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels we're all ablaze, and you thought your Mustang was cool. <laughs> a river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And the court was seated, and the books were opened. Everybody, all authority belongs to God. But look at this. God judges arrogance. Then I continued to watch 
because of the boastful words of the horn was making. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And there's overtures here of the book of Revelation of the beast and the antichrist. You glad you came to church today? Woo! The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. So God delegates authority. God judges arrogance. You can see here they were stripped of it. But look at this here, verse 13. Get ready for Jesus, everybody. Are you ready? Get ready for Jesus. In my vision at night, I looked... And there before me was one like a son of man. The Irish guy's getting excited. (laughs) One like the son of man. What did Jesus call himself? And what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He reveals himself as what? The son of man. The son of man. Coming with clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days, his father, and was led into his presence. Ah, everyone, this is an image of Jesus after the cross, Philippians chapter 2, who Jesus humbled himself and became like nothing and then God exalted him to the highest place he was given authority glory and sovereign power and all nations and peoples of every language worshiped him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed everyone sleep better tonight I'm serious, sleep better tonight because God is on the throne. The son of man who's been exalted, Jesus himself is seated beside him and he has all power and all authority. Come on, everyone. There's people in this world, they're posturing and they're pretending and they're thinking they're this and they're that. God rules and he reigns. Do you know that God is attracted to the humble, but actually he opposes the pride. That's what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5. (laughs) He said, if you're going to be all filled with pride, I'm going to oppose you. But if you're humble, I'm going to be attracted to you. Jesus shows a different form of leadership and power than any other leader ever had before. Remember, he came into the city on Palm Sunday. Remember, he came in. How did he do it? He didn't come in a big stallion. What did he ride? A lowly donkey, everybody. A lowly donkey. Yet he won the greatest victory ever on the cross. More than defeating an army, he defeated sin and death. That's what Jesus did. And he's been exalted to the highest place. Why is it important to teach this today? Because I want you to read the book of Daniel. I want you to read this. Like if your Bible reading plan is once a year to read through the Bible. I don't want you to get into Daniel chapter 6 and going, that was good, right? Whoa, skip, next book. I want you reading through, so when it comes to Daniel chapter 7, you go, I have a little idea of what's going on here. Amen, everybody? Okay, here we go then. The next point simply is this, okay, major lessons and promises. So we've got a major lesson in power, the humble are exalted, but then there's a major lesson in promises, the hopeful are energized. When you get the promises of God into your mind and into your heart and spirit, you are suddenly energized. And this is what it says here. Look at this um, verse 2. It says, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, very important here, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. Remember, we studied him a couple of weeks ago, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. The desolation of Jerusalem was when Nebuchadnezzar came to the city in 586 BC and literally devastated the place and took away the best of the land, the, uh, all the stuff from the temple and the best intellectual property in the minds of the young men like Daniel. But this is important, everyone. What this really teaches us, and this is, we've got to grasp this, is that Daniel read the word of God. And you're going, oh, well, he was a Christian. No, no, just stop here for a moment. Are any of you out there busy? Any, any of you busy? Any of you busy? I mean, oh, come on, everyone. I'm just back from Ireland. I let me say, when you go back to Ireland, let's just say it is a slower pace. One of the things that I did notice in Ireland, and I'm not saying it's the best thing in the world, but there's a lot of bars and pubs in every village. Because I think people are going in there when it's raining and they're just like all relaxing and chilling out until the rain goes. And the rain never goes. They must live in there. (laughs) It never goes. But in California, we're like busy, 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 busy bees everywhere. And one of the things that really confuses me about California is that everyone seems to have a retirement plan 
but nobody retires. <laughs> Who gets all that money? That's just what I want to know. Everybody is working, working, working. They've got four or five jobs. And they're always busy and they're proud about their jobs. We're, we're just so proud about how busy we are. But if you are too busy to read the word of God every single day, you are too busy. There's an arrogance in that. Also, there is a dietary deficiency in your life. What does that mean? You are more than flesh and blood. And you might skip a meal, but you won't skip food all day. That's a silly thing to do. You wouldn't do that. And God says, but you have a spiritual diet that can only be fed through what? The word of God, the bread of life. And I know you're busy, but Daniel was way busier than you because he was the second most powerful man in the world, like the prime minister of a global empire. And yet every day he read the word of God. Look at me. This is a great time in the year when we come to August so that we can just like recalibrate Kids are going back to school. Yes, vacations are over. It's like the second new year. It's like January all over again. Look at me, everyone. Do yourself and your spirit a favor and read the word of God. Pastor Ray said our new series is going to be on the book of Colossians. Start reading it every day, okay? It's four chapters, everybody. It does. It takes about 12 minutes to read it. That's about like, you know, a third of an episode of anything on Netflix, and you watch four of those every day, okay? Are you with me? So Daniel read God's promises, but then Daniel believed God's promises. This is really important, everyone. Daniel believed God's promises. You know what? If you don't read God's promises, you'll never believe God's promises. So what Daniel did, this is the way it worked. He read the book of Jeremiah, very interesting theologically here. Not even a generation had gone past, and the Jewish people regarded the words of Jeremiah as scripture already. Isn't that interesting? And Daniel's reading it and he's looking at it and he goes, wow, I've got my calendar, I've got my calculator and I'm working out that what Jeremiah said would happen is about to come true. Boom. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm going to believe this stuff and I'm going I'm to operate and act on the back of it. You see, there's a lot of Christians and they believe that this is the word of God. How many people believe this is the word of God? But I'm going to ask you a very simple question. How many of you are believing for what's in the word of God? You're actually believing not just in something, but you're believing for something. You see, my friends, that is faith. It's not just this intellectual academic nod towards this book and then put it on a shelf. It's saying, I'm going to believe that there are promises in this book that apply to my life. Are you with me? Yes? It's really important that we grasp this and that we go for this in our lives. There's a great promise in Scripture, and it simply says this. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, Jesus said, I will never leave you, nor will I what? Forsake you. How many people believe the promises of God? Well, why do we worry so much? Come on, everybody. I mean, it's one thing to get that, you know, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and put it on the wall. But come on, involve them in your finances. In your, flam in your family planning. Do you know what I'm saying? In your financial budgets. Involve them, not just don't talk to him before dinner every day in grace. Let's pray together as a family. Are you with me? Let's do these things. So it's not only like I want to believe in the word of God, I want to believe for the word of God because it's so, so important in my life. So Daniel believed God's promises and, um, and then listen to this here, Daniel prayed God's promises and this is a natural reaction. If you're here today and you're going, my prayer life, it ain't great, it ain't great, it just seems to lack power. Guess what, everyone? If you read the word of God and you start looking at some of those promises and you actually take those promises to God, it is going to transform your prayer life. And that leads us to our next point here, okay? A major lesson from Daniel, if he was standing here in the 21st century, what would he say to us? He would say, learn something to do with power, something to do with promises, and look at this one here, and something to do with prayer. There's a major lesson in prayer. The faithful are encouraged. So Daniel, what does he do? He reads the promises of God and then he immediately 
praise the promise of God. So verse three, so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and in ashes. That's what I did. I actually heard what God said, believed it, and then said, God, this is what you said. And he started praying it. But jump with me to Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 to 13, because in Daniel chapter 9, he gets this massive prayer. And then he gets another angelic vision, and we'll talk about that later. He gets a a revelation that this is not just going to last 70 years, this exile, but 70 times seven, which is 490. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then in Daniel chapter 10, he gets a visitor and it's an an angelic being. And look at this here in verse 12. It says, then he, the angel continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set set your mind to gain understanding and to what? Humble yourself before your God. Look at me, humble people pray. Arrogant people go it alone. Arrogant people at their last resort turn to God. Humble people make him their first call every day. Daniel the busy man, Daniel the busy man, the busiest man on the planet, everybody. He read God's word every day and listen to this. He prayed how many times a day? Three times a day. Three times a day, he opened the windows of his apartment, got down on his knees, pointed towards Jerusalem and prayed. You don't need to do that in Starbucks. I'm going to say this here. And you don't need to be Daniel. Wouldn't it be great if we could all pray three times a day? But what about once? You see, wise people like Daniel, busy people like Daniel, prioritize God in their lives. It's so important, everyone. Can I encourage you to do this? Because this really is a big deal. But you're going to get a revelation here, okay? So that you humble yourself before God. Your words were heard. That's good news. And I have come in response to them. That's really good news. That's like UPS arrive at the door. Hey, I've come in response. But you've been a bit late. Well, let me tell you why. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. He held me up. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. What does this actually mean? It simply means this, that Daniel got down on his knees. He prayed to God, sent his text message up. Boom! Delivered comes up in his little thing, an iMessage. Delivered. God has heard my prayer. God says, absolutely good. Add to cart. I'm going to answer his prayers. Deliver that. Deliver it. And you know what? It didn't get delivered for 21 days. Why? Because there was a demonic force over the area of Persia called the Prince of Persia who held up even an answer from God. It was like God says, I want to answer, but it was like the demonic highway of the I-80. How many people know all the demons live on the I-80, okay? Okay. It was like just jammed with traffic that this evil power, supernatural power, had orchestrated. Have you ever thought about this? And even that angel needed to say, get me the archangel Michael to come and fight with me to get this guy out of the road so that we can get the answer to Daniel. And did Daniel know any of this was happening? No. He was just like you and I in Starbucks praying, calling out to God. And yet, there was this whole spiritual battle going on ahead. Look at me. The stuff we can't see is more real than the stuff we can. And you're going, Andrew, this is like stranger things today. Well, you know, a lot of people say to me, we don't want to go too extreme on this. I, exa- I'm with you. We don't want to exaggerate this stuff, but we cannot mute it either. Come on, everyone. This is, there's some stuff that's happening in your life. Can I just say this honestly? There's some stuff that's happening in your life and you can't blame the devil. You're an idiot. <laughs> okay, can I just be gentle and love you and pastor you and that there? If I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot. I can't blame the devil. I can't blame the devil for that. But there's other stuff that's happening in my life. Listen to me. I don't know everything that's going on, but the Bible does reveal to me in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are fighting a war against principalities and powers in high places. Now, I see some Christians and they take this to an extreme and they say, hey, before we can come in and evangelize an area, we must identify the demon and the controlling parts. No, that was not the practice of the early church at all. They just went in and brought the gospel. 
And they left all of that to God. And if they got a revelation of it, well, that was good. But they didn't stop everything until they got that. They went forward with what Jesus said, which was go into all the world and preach the gospel. Just go and do it. Yes, but my spirit will lead you and he will guide you. But this is really important, everybody. The stuff above us is probably way bigger than the stuff around us. And we live in a spiritual battle. And if you just think that you can get through this life with your income and with your wisdom, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. This stuff is real. I'm not getting spooked out. I don't think, oh, there's a demon behind there. Please, whoa. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, everybody. Amen? I really mean that. But I do understand from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 4, this is very, very important, that though we live in the world, we do not war as the world does. And the weapons, we don't fight with the world's weapons. Actually, the, f- the weapons we fight with, they have divine power to pull down strongholds. Is this good news, everybody? Now, come on, some of you need to get it together. Some of you couples need to, come on, husband, stop leaving this stuff to your wife. Well, she's the spiritual one. No, she's not. You're the spiritual one. You just need to exercise that muscle, get back in the spiritual gym, get together, and stand for your family. Amen? I got to watch. Oh, I'm enjoying myself today. I really am. Look at this here. Daniel was predictable in prayer. Really important. He was predictable in prayer. He did it three times a day. He was patient in prayer. When it was held up 21 days, he didn't give up, everybody. He didn't know what was going on, why, was, why the answer wasn't coming. He was faithful, and he stayed, and he was patient in prayer. And, and, uh, and he, he was powerful in prayer. I mean, powerful in prayer. Let me show this here just for one second. Um, when I was back in Ireland, um, I went to visit this island here. It's got a picture of it going to come up. I took that photograph myself. That's called Skellig Michael. And it's just off uh, uh, the coast of Kerry, um, right down at the bottom of Ireland. And look at me. If you've never been to Ireland, I'm going to give you God's will for your life. You've got to go to Ireland before you die, everybody, okay? I call it the Starbucks fund. Starbucks will fund it, okay? So every time you go to Starbucks go to Starbucks once, and the next time you go, don't go. Just put the money in the Ireland fund. You'll be there in two years, trust me, okay? And, and we, we went out there, and most people, they go out to Skellig Michael, okay? They go out to this island called Skellig Michael because they're looking for these guys here. They're looking for these guys. Do you recognize them? Oh, there he is. How many people saw that Star Wars movie, okay? There they are. That's Curtin Lincoln. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and so there's Ray and there's Luke Skywalker. And that's where Luke Skywalker hung out. And, and there was Luke Skywalker's little house. No, nonsense, everyone. That's not where Luke Skywalker went. And that's not, where the first, that's not why the first people went out. The first people went out to that island and built those houses in the sixth century. They were born again Christians that lived in Ireland, and remember this, at that time they thought Ireland, the west coast of Ireland, was the end of the world. They didn't know if they kept paddling, they'd get to New York. They didn't know that, they'd get some great pizza, but they stayed in Ireland. And they stayed in Ireland thinking it was the end of the world, but they went to the bottom of Ireland and they saw that island, Skellig Michael, and they thought, that's the ends of the earth and the gospel should go to the ends of the earth and we're gonna go out there with our monastic beliefs and we're gonna seek the face of God. It's quiet, it's isolated, it's focused. That's where we're going to go. And they went out and they built those little prayer huts. Isn't that incredible? In the sixth century, everybody. I think that if Daniel were here today, if those monastic Christians were here today, they would say to us, look at me, they would say to us, you gotta pray. They said, you gotta pray. Amen, everybody? We all agree, but when are we gonna do it? Well, we don't have like a fancy little prayer hut, you know, beehive like that. But, but look at this. We do have one here. And it's just over there. And it looks like this. You all know where the cafe is. Well, don't go to the cafe. Go to the prayer room. No, I don't get that. Go to the cafe and love them. But you can book time in that prayer room. And this is my heart. Listen to me, everyone. This is my heart that you would go to that prayer room. You can book in online by just texting PRAY to 56316. This is not a seal gimmick. This is the heart and the life of our church. We need to pray. And when you go into that room, there's a guy to help you pray. You know what to do when you go in there. But what I would love is during the daylight hours, 
every single day that we would have someone in that prayer room praying for this campus and for everything that God's going to do. How many people think that God's going to listen when he sees us humbling ourselves like that? Amen? Come on. Get on to it. Text pray to 56316. Okay, finally, here it is, everyone. You're going to love this. You've got to stay with me. Everyone stay with me because this is going to be like, boom. You ready? The major lesson in prophecy, the confident live in expectation. So we call this series Major Lessons from Major Prophets. And prophets sometimes, you know, you can think of like Luke Skywalker and Jedi. It's not. These were real people in the real world. But this is what 1 Peter says. They were carried along by the Spirit of God. Not in a big existential, ecstatic sort of. It's just quietly God nudging them. Like when you go home today, I encourage you to read Daniel chapter 11. I mean, it's like history before it happens. History before it happens. You know, in Daniel chapter 11, there's only 35 verses. But in those 35 verses, there are 135 predictions of the future. Come on, everybody. Isn't that incredible? 135 predictions in 35 verses. What was Daniel seeing? What was Daniel seeing? Remember I said it earlier on. He was seeing something about like the near future. L look at this image on the screen here. I'm going to call it the mountain of prophecy. This is Daniel standing close to the mountain, like close up to it. And he's, he's seeing stuff in front of him. Remember we said earlier on, he's seeing the that the Babylonians are here and then the Persians are going to come and then Alexander the Great and then Rome's going to come and it's going to be the 70 times 70, 490 years from where he was and then the coming of Christ. Christ was coming. Oh my goodness, this is incredible. The son of man, he's going to come. Boom, boom, boom. And he's seeing it, but still doesn't really know how it's all going to happen. And he's seeing this mountain, but he's seeing one mountain and two peaks. 2003, I had the privilege of uh, being able to climb Europe's highest mountain, Mont Blanc. And I remember looking at it and going, my goodness, a big old tall mountain. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, clouds at the top of it. And I'm looking at it and going, that is really big and that's really big. And then the clouds cleared and went, whoa, it's way bigger than I thought it was. I thought I was looking at the top, but there was something beyond it. This mountain had two peaks. And what Daniel was seeing was one mountain with two peaks. And this is it, everyone. He was seeing B.C., and he was seeing A.D. You know what I'm talking about? He was seeing before Christ and he was seeing Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And so what Daniel saw was this. Look at me here, everyone. What he saw was at this moment, B.C., Christ is going to come. And what Jesus is going to do is he is going to close B.C. He's going to get that era, that epoch of time, and he's going to wrap it all up. But Daniel saw beyond it. Remember, we talked about the beast with the ten horns and the little horn. The beast and the antichrist. Daniel was seeing something that was going to happen in one time period and something that was going to be repeated in another time period. But this is what Daniel says. And this is what he says to all of us today is that both those eras of time, they are going to be finished and it's going to be the same person that's going to finish both of them because Jesus came at BC and he through his death and resurrection and ascension, he finished BC and when he ascended, the angel said, don't stand here and look around, go out and preach the gospel, but know this, this same Jesus will return to this mountain, the Mount of Olives, and he will stand here again and he will come with the trumpet song and he will take his church back to be with him, everybody. What is Daniel saying to us? He says this, God wins. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, kingdoms come, kingdoms go. But the ancient of days with the son of man, he rules forever. He rules forever. So what do we do with all of this? You see, if anyone ever comes up to you and go, I completely understand Daniel 7 to 12, and I know when Jesus shall return, they're smoking dope. 
And I know that some of you really wished it had been a fill-in today. And Jesus will return on, write it in everybody, the 6th of February, la 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 la. Nah, we don't know, we don't know. And don't let this divide us. A great American preacher called A.W. Tozer, A.W. Tozer, he was incredible. He preached a lot, went on long tours. And he always said this, that after a long preaching tour, the best thing was getting home to my kids, getting back to see my kids. And he said, I always thought about coming up the garden path through the front door. Yeah, I love you, daddy. He said, but the worst thing that could ever have happened was as I come back from a preaching tour to see my children, if I came up the garden path and the downstairs lounge window was open and I heard my kids fighting and screaming at each other and they were going, no, daddy said he was coming home on a plane. No, he didn't. He said he was coming home on a train. No, he didn't. Said he was coming home on a bus. He said that would break my heart if they were fighting about how I was coming home. I just want them celebrating daddy's coming home. And look at me, everybody. You can have your different views on this stuff, but the main thing is Jesus is coming home. Jesus will return. He will return. And here's the question. Are you ready? Look at me. Don't you dare walk out of this place. Are you ready? I pray that for every single person in this room watching online, Video Cafe, that you have decades to live. You don't know if you've got minutes to live. And you don't know that Jesus could come back now, right now. He could return. And you're going, but I meant to play golf today. Stop it. Look at me. He could return. Question, are you ready? No one moving. I want you to close your eyes because this is too important. If you're here, you're not yet a Christian. You're not ready to meet Jesus. You don't have to wait to judgment day to meet Jesus, to his returning to meet Jesus. Jesus wants to meet with you right now here in this place. So if you're saying, I want to be ready for that day, Say this prayer with me and enter into that living relationship with Jesus. Are you ready? I'm going to say a simple prayer. You can just repeat it. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that when you first came, you died for me and you died for my sins. And I confess I'm a sinner. Jesus, take away my sins. Take away my past. Give me your cleansing. Give me your future. And Jesus, become my Lord and my God today, the God of all of my decisions. And Jesus, I now look forward to your coming as my God.